everybody. Um, welcome to the Science Careers Fair and the Sports Science Panel. Um, thank you for taking the time out today. Um, my name's Fiona Stubbs. I'm the Careers Manager for the College of Medical Veterinary and Life Sciences. And before we start, I'd just like to do some housekeeping uh, tips so you get the most out of today's event. Uh, in it. So the event is on webinar, so um, your cameras and microphones will be turned on. If you want to ask a, a question, then do so using the Q&A function at the right of your screen. Um, you can upvote your peers' questions if you think they've got a fantastic question by voting for it. So that question then gets to the top of the list. Please don't use the chat function as you might have done in Zoom. Uh, use the Q&A function. Uh, the webinar will be recorded and you'll find copies of it on our YouTube channel in a few weeks. Um, what else have I got to say? Uh, I'd just like to introduce you to Nen. Nen, as you all know, uh, lectures here at the University of Glasgow and him and I are going to be your co-hosts today. But I would also like to welcome Lewis, Kirsty, and Paul as our panel members. Thank you. Right. I'm on the first question, so can you please remind us uh, of your job titles and sort of typical things you might do in your jobs, starting with Lewis, please. Sure, no problem. Um, as I've been introduced by Fiona there, thank you very much. Um, my name's Lewis Millen. Um, I'm a first team sports scientist here at Fulham Football Club. Um, so kind of my day to day running is very different, changes every day but my kind of main role is data risk analysis, I suppose you can say. Um, I deal with all the data from medical to sports science to other areas such as player recruitment um, here at first team level. Um, and I can be involved with things like recovery days, so taking blood samples, salivas, uh, internal markers such as heart rate variability, um, and external markers like GPS. I analyze that risk altogether, give that to uh, the coaching staff, the management, and interpret that information for them so then they can make some sort of ideas of where to put the load and our players optimum performance. Kirsty? So um, I'm a bit different to Lewis, I did my sports science degree for something completely different. Um, so I recently started in recruitment, so I do private equity recruitment at the moment. Um, to this about four months ago and um, so I mostly would be speaking with clients to get new clients on whether that be different private equity funds and mostly work with investment bankers and uh, moving them over to, to private equity and um, so my day-to-day -day is calling a lot of people and uh, doing data analytics on that as well which my degrees help with and yeah we should and um, candidate generation and management as well. So yeah, we can go into that a bit more and if that doesn't make sense to anybody. No, yeah, no, that's, yeah, no that's, that's great. So, you know, Thank you. And Paul, on to you, lastly. Thank you, Fiona. Um, again, a little bit different to Lewis and Kirsty. Um, I'm a physiotherapist. Um, been a physiotherapist for about 10 years now. Um, I own my own business um, in Singapore. I'm not in Singapore right now, I'm, I'm in Ireland. Um, but yeah, my day to day is kind of twofold dealing with people who have acute injuries, um, such as sports, um, running, football, rugby, dealing with them both after surgery and just acute injuries. And then the usual run of the mill knee pains, back pains, neck pains, you'll see in everyday athletes and general population. Thank you. That was succinct. Um, going on to a classic careers question is what do you love about your jobs and what are the frustrations about your jobs? Starting with Lewis again. Um, oh, that's a good question. Um, I love the fact that it's people orientated. So the fact that I get to deal with so many different stakeholders, players, whoever, it's fantastic, but also you can see tangible change. So one of my areas is sleep. I love to look at that kind of stuff and analyze it. And what I can see is if we alter sleep and we improve sleep hygiene, that has a tangible effect on the player's performance, but also their lifestyle and their health in general. So I love to see that and see that side of improvements. Um, but one story I have specifically is 
um, in, in football and elite sport, it's not the money you're going for. It's not for anything like that. Uh, the days off, you don't have any hours and stuff. Um, and that's the frustration, but it's the moments that you can have lived for. So in 2020, I was during the coronavirus, I was at the playoff final. And during that period of time, that's known as um, the most expensive match in the world. It's 120 million that goes involved with that. Now, there was no one in the stadium for Wembley, um, but you felt all the pressure from everyone watching because everyone was at home during lockdown. And the moment when we won that game was indescribable. The feelings that I had was just complete euphoria. And I think that's the moments that you live for in elite sport. And that's probably what I love the most about it. And the challenges? Challenges, like I said, is the hours that you work. So yeah. I think last month I worked 21 days straight. Um, I think I've had about 18 days off, uh, like holiday, um, 18 days of holiday since about 2019. Um, so yeah, that's probably the challenges that you face in elite sport. But I wouldn't change any of that for the moments that you get, such as uh, the playoff finals and the feelings that you get on that front. Oh, great example, thank you. Kirsty, mm -hmm. what about yourself? Uh, what do you enjoy and what are your challenges? Yeah, so um, I personally like speaking to a lot of people, every day I'm quite a people person. Um, I previously worked in the NHS as doing like audits for stroke patients and it was very, I didn't really speak to anyone, it was very much just number crunching essentially. So I like how many people I can speak to every day, um, as well as that with recruitment you sort of run your own desk. So they do kind of look for people with a background because we're naturally quite competitive people and um, so you've got to be very much results driven and you financially see the reward of that and um, frustration um, people can be great on paper you go in and into an interview everything's uncontrollable factors you have no control over anything <laughs> and there's nothing that you can do about that I suppose similar um, not similar to Lewis, obviously he's done 21 days straight last month, I did not, um, but um, frustration, it can be long hours, you start maybe seven, half seven in the morning, some days you might finish at nine at night, ten at night, and the candidate might still fail in the interview, again, uh, uncontrollable, but the deal and you see it uh, financially yourself, it's quite rewarding, so it kind of spurs you on to, to keep going, but yeah, completely different side that you have, just naturally being from a sporting background definitely helps with that. I like that, the fact that you're a sport person and you can convey that kind of transferable skill or values about competitiveness uh, along with meeting targets. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Kirsty. And Paul, what about yourself? What do you really enjoy and what are your challenges in being a uh, physiotherapist? At the risk of being a bit of a parrot between Lewis and Kirsty, I'm going to say dealing with people. Um, but that's both my joy and my frustration <laughs> because um, you just get to see such a right away of people. And it's it's a cliche. You do get, when you see somebody who makes an improvement in their quality of life, the ability to get somebody to walk after a surgery or return to, to return to the swimming pool or an elite athlete achieving their PBs after you've been helping them. It's amazing um, the, the the payoff you get from it. Um, I was a never a very good athlete myself, so I tend to live vicariously through a lot of my patients. But the frustrations are that you you, you see people at very low points of their life um, when they're injured. Um, really, uh, physiologically and psychologically, people are very difficult to deal with when they are struggling. And uh, you, it sometimes is quite difficult to not take that home with you if you're someone who's quite empathetic, uh, which I am. Um, it can be quite a challenge to, when you're listening to somebody who are putting all their physiological problems onto you, it, t 10 people or 12 people or 15 people in a day, at the end of the day, you can be physiologic, you can be exhausted yourself. So the frustration and the other slight frustration is being a business owner during a global pandemic, not really the best thing when your job requires you seeing people face to face. And when I was living in Singapore, people playing sports, um, because there's no point in being a sports physiotherapist if all the sports have been banned for two years. So that was the the more frustrating part of my recent job. But um, there's the, the frustrations of being a physiotherapist are just the, it's the double edged sword. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, on to my sort of the next question is, 
what were your first jobs out of graduation? And I always try to sort of um, ease students because they often think that they should hit their dream job. I hate that phrase, but their dream job or their target job or their destination job as soon as they graduate. And I say that, you know, don't fret about that so much. Um, get a job, get some experience. So what was your first job out of uh, graduation? And did it provide a platform for where you are now? Lewis? This was my first job out of graduation. <laughs> what dream job? <laughs> Counterintuitive, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, no. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I gra as soon as I graduated, I uh, had an opportunity to go out to America and do some like volunteering out there uh, to work with athletes trying to get into the MBLS, uh, sorry, MLS. Um, and also the Canadian Premier League. So I decided to take the opportunity to go out there and do some wee bits and pieces um, and test the athletes there. And then flew over to Norway and worked with the Olympic team there for three months before having my graduate job at Fulham. Um, so yeah, I'm really sorry. That was probably a bad example. <laughs> so yeah, I've been here for three years now. Brilliant. Sorry. <laughs> well, no, 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 it's good. It's good, it's good to know that it happens. Yeah. Uh, Kirsty, yourself. Uh, I've got a bit of a more of a mixed bag, to be honest. Um, so I finished my undergraduate and I did uh, an applied master's with Celtic Football Club for a year. Uh, that got cut short, obviously, with coronavirus. So I actually went home for a year and uh, milked cows <laughs> on a farm. Um, so that was <laughs> slightly different again, using those transferable skills. Um, <laughs> but from there, uh, once I got my thesis um, draft finished off, I started in the NHS as the stroke auditor and um, so that was just going around wards, a lot of data analytics and sort of almost copying and pasting numbers, a lot of number crunching. Um, but definitely the Excel spreadsheet management with formulas and things like that definitely helped with that and I'd say even just having the experience at Celtic and acknowledging that it wasn't quite for me has definitely helped and stood out for employers moving forward. So I wouldn't change my sort of mixed bag pathway uh, to where I am now because uh, no, it's been it's been a journey through COVID as well. But no, ha happy to have got to where I am now. <laughs> yeah, it's a principle. No experience is bad experience, isn't it? Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and and yourself, Paul. Uh, yes. Yeah, so after. I, I did a graduate entry master's for physiotherapy two and a half years after I graduated from sports science. But my first actual paid job out of sports science was working in a pub. And I, I've said this to people in the past and they look at me like I'm crazy. Actually working in a pub was one of the best things that I could have done to be a physiotherapist because <laughs> you work in a high pressure environment. You've got lots of people. Some people are nice to you. Some people are not, especially pubs in Glasgow. They're not that nice to you. You have to, you, you get pretty good at kind of being confident, being, it was just really strange, but time management and um, dealing with people. If you can't, as a physiotherapist, if you can't actually get somebody to like you and buy into you within five minutes, then you might as well not bother with it. So it, it seems like a really strange thing to say, but working in a pub and then being, and doing the waitering in the, in the bar, uh, the restaurant for the bar was was great because it gave me so many transferable skills that when I then went to do my extra degree and you were put down in front of somebody who's got a lifelong knee problem, at least you can start a conversation with them. And once you start a conversation, then that's where it comes in. So uh, yeah, working in a pub. <laughs> <laughs> great. No, no, I, I'm all for it. Consumer facing experiences, whether it's pub and hospitality, retail, on some sort of you know phone, you know phone experience yep excellent answer okay i think it's you now man yep okay good afternoon everyone um yeah so my question is how much of the knowledge and skills that you gained from your degree do you now currently use in your current role now uh, talking about your undergraduate degree in in sports science specifically. Uh, obviously, Paul, were you doing your your very applied masters in, in physiotherapy, you're learning the skills of physiotherapy, but it's, it's the, the, the physiology sports science course that you all have in common that you did. So what skills and knowledge did you, do you still use from that degree? Um, we'll go with Lewis again. We'll start with Lewis. 
at all, obviously, with uh, working in sports science. Um, no, I use it every day. Um, it's, it's everything that I've learned when I was at university is so applicable right now. But there's other bits and pieces, I think, not just the degree, but the something that was spoken about with Paul and the kind of pub situation. I think at university, all the life skills that you learn at, at the University of Glasgow um, have been more applicable here. Uh, so one thing that we did quite a lot in the degree was presentations and debates. Um, weirdly, that's very vital um, when you're working in elite sport because you've got so many different stakeholders being involved. You've got to speak to the management in a certain way. You've got to speak to the players in a different way. And then when you're having disagreements with the medical team um, or other sports scientists, you have to have that ability to communicate your thoughts succinctly. Um, so I think that side of it's been really good. Um, in terms of the modules that we do, obviously very applicable for me. Um, I use them every day and the skill sets that we learn of how to be an independent learner. So I still do that. So I still have to read the latest journals, read up on the latest things, go to the CPD and use that. So yeah, very applicable for me. Okay, thanks, Lewis. Uh, Kirsty? Yeah, so obviously the, the content of the course, like the actual physiological sides of it, I don't use in my day to day. Um, but I would say similar to what Lewis has said, I think even joining different clubs at university, you, I don't know, I, I got a bit too involved with hockey and things like that. So you actually, you really have to develop your like time management skills and that really helps you moving forward. And a job, you're never just juggling your what you're doing in your day to day and you might have multiple for example yesterday you could be juggling like three different clients and 15 different candidates in a day and um, so just having that management and being able to make your own organizational systems which i always find like an excel spreadsheet and things like that really helpful and um, as well as that data analytics i know everybody hates um, <laughs> the statistical modules um, in the undergraduate course and everyone thinks that they're not that they probably what I use most uh, as well as obviously the presentation skills and things like that but that would be the statistical sides of things I would probably use the most um, of course obviously I, I don't use the, the content of like physical determinants of performance and those sorts of modules <laughs> in my day to day but yeah definitely transferable Good. Thanks, Kirsty. Lewis likes statistics, we know that. Um, okay, Paul, Love if it. you can remember that far back um, <laughs> about your undergrad. Oh, that's what I use, all the stuff you taught me, mate. Um, <laughs> it has been a long time ago, actually, a bit longer than Lewis and Kirsty. And I suppose for a few years, you didn't realise what you were using because, I, because, like you say, I went into another a very applied um, course and, and an accelerated master's and then into working in it. And, um, you don't realize it, but there was there was times where I would do things slightly differently from my other colleagues in, in my department and in the university. And there were skills, there was knowledge. Um, I, I mentioned the uh, length tension relationship to somebody one day, and they looked at me like I had two heads. And I don't know how this remembered it because we were, we were doing it in the isokinetic machine. Because obviously, isokinetic is a very big part of rehabilitation that not many people know about. That I had exposure to amazingly in in the labs, and without trying to over egg the length tension relationship that's pretty much key for pretty much all injuries that if you can understand that as a physiotherapist then you get it because that's how people get injured they get too far to their length and blah, 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 blah. so i was one day i was sitting there and i was going why do i remember that so easily and it was because i just i remembered it from from the labs from being down and the, the practical side of it and being able to conduct when i went into my masters and, and further on being able to conduct experiments the the group work that we did through level th year three and year four we had like we all laughed about it at the time it was like in the in the in the chambers with the the humidity and the cold and and on the treadmills and doing the and it was more so the fact that i went into the next course and then further on i knew what science was i, I knew how to do science and i knew that um how to appraise literature how to how to discern whether it was any good or not and just you were a scientist before you then became a physiotherapist and I, I genuinely believe that my profession should be a graduate entry program because I think you should have this basis of um of being a scientist first because at the end of the day that's what we are um and there there was a few things that you just it just crops up now and again you're like oh why, why do I remember that from like 
God, nearly 15 years ago now. Um, <laughs> but it, it's still there. It, it, it's still there. And uh, I, I've, I've leaned back on it numerous times because um, it just pops up and you're able to, it's having that extra kind of, um, that, that extra just skill that people who have not done sports science or, or another course like that um, would have. Um, yeah, I remember some. Good. Good to know that it's still in there somewhere. Thanks, Paul. Um, okay, so next question, and you've all got a, you've all picked up applied experience along the way. So, Lewis, obviously with the the Cathcart scholarship, and then your MSI work placement. Kirsty going to to do her masters with, with Celtic, and Paul even with his undergraduate project did work with a, a hockey team, and then going on to his masters as well. So, how much of that? really applied experience so anything you're uh, anything out with the lecture theater anything out with the labs that applied experience how much has that improved your chances of a uh, employability and getting on to the, the career that you're currently in so we'll keep the traditional we'll start with, with lewis again perfect thank you um well actually i worked with kirsty at one point on one of my kind of uh roles where i was working with the women's hockey team at glasgow and i made horrific mistakes, loads of mistakes, which have actually been really beneficial to me now. Um, because one of them was I tried to do a, I think a bleep test, but we wanted to make sure that they didn't know about it. And then that caused uproar. So I realized they've got to know these things beforehand and then deal with that kind of situation. So I still remember that. Um, but it was a brilliant because it then made me go on to another internship with um, and con create connections with Scottish Ballet, which I believe the university now still has connections with for, for programs. Yep. So that was that was really good. Um, but my MSI placement was fantastic because I spent a year here at Fulham as an intern. Uh, there I developed my skills. One thing that's been talked about quite a lot is analytics um, by Kirsty. And I kind of put myself wholly into that. I found a niche area that I'm pretty good at and got uh, very good at and could analyze loads. And that became my responsibility. From that, that gave me a consultancy job with the first team whilst I was finishing my degree. Um, and then from there, it was brilliant for my final year because I got more experience and more exposure to understanding what load was, what match outputs were whilst I was finishing my degree, which helped me with my actual dissertations there. Now, um, I then did the Cathcart scholarship and decided I wanted to go quite out my comfort zone. Uh, so I went to a place that speaks good English, but it's not the first language and went to Norway um, and decided I wanted to learn from the Olympics there. So I went to Oslo and worked out there for three months. Um, incredible experience. I got to work with seven different federations. Um, I was working on things like uh, different testing metrics and understanding what was the difference between a gold medalist, a silver medalist, and a bronze medalist. And I had to present that to the seven federations. My, re my research into that it was phenomenal. I got to understand what it was like to spend four years of your life trying to go to the Olympics. Um, I got to work with rehab and all these areas, something that I would never get the exposure for if I didn't take the opportunities at hand. Um, but more importantly, the guys from Norway, when I got the job at Fulham, came back across to visit me because I had those connections. Uh, from there, we I showed them a presentation on some research and they offered to fund a PhD. Um, so I was given a scholarship with the University of Glasgow from funding from Norway to do a PhD on this research. So um, if I hadn't had the Cathcart scholarship, I wouldn't be currently doing the PhD um, and I wouldn't have got the experiences that I had if I hadn't done the MSI placement, I wouldn't have got the job that I had at the moment. So, yeah. All ties in nicely. Absolutely. There you go. Yeah. Good. <laughs> uh, Kirsty, so I know you had a bit of an up and down time when you were at, at Celtic, but um, what about those experiences there? How do you think that's kind of helped you get to where you are just now? Yeah, so uh, obviously the court course structure for the, the undergraduate is two years general biology chemistry and then you specialise third and fourth year so I got to third year and just felt like I was like oh my goodness I don't know anything about sports science yet so I think I contacted 30 different like football clubs across Scotland um, and only Hibs replied <laughs> and thankfully they, um, they got me in the next day and I ended up interning with them for about a year and a half through my undergrad ended up doing my dissertation with them as well and that sort of led into the to the masters and um, applied masters with celtic i would say probably if i had with hibs and um, that might not have um 
that might not come about with Celtic. So grateful for that. And I'd say definitely moving forward, my, my employ current employer actually said, um, being a recruiter himself, you'd think that he would look at your CV. He didn't look at my CV at all. And the, he said the only thing I saw was Celtic and Hibs. And he's like, yeah, I just thought I'd give you a go. <laughs> I was like, all right then. So I say you definitely, um, he's maybe regretting now, but um, he's, uh, it's definitely something that stands out in your CV and just gives you that added extra. So I'd say it definitely would increase your employability just from sort of a standout perspective. Good. Excellent, Kirsty. Thank you. Um, Paul, over to you. What about the applied experience that you've gained across over the years? Um, when, like I say, when I actually having the course and having the knowledge and the understanding and all the, the course con contents, that's what allowed me to get accepted in my um, graduate entry masters. So first of all, it actually allowed me to move on to the next step of my career. Um, I did... I, I worked with Motherwell as a performance analyst. Um, I know performance analyst in Motherwell, you might not have a huge amount to do for a while, but uh, I, I did a tour of Scottish grounds for a year and tried all the pies. Kilmarnock was overrated. But um, I, employability, once I, went, once I finished my first kind of job as a physiotherapist, I ended up working for the Football Association of Singapore. So I got a job with their elite squads and what differentiated me did we differentiated me from the interview stage and for everybody else was that I was able to in my applied masters we did a lot of you didn't you, you should have said elite hockey teams because it was your hockey teammate you forgot to put that in and um, the the idea that I was able to just talk about the O2 max test and the lactate profile test and just the stuff that we did in the labs you you, you could speak performance so you're not just someone who's a physiotherapist who you've I was able to again kind of cross the bridge into the football science and medicine department. So having all those skills and then the ability to deal with athletes and to talk to athletes and to look at data and to to uh, look at trends and just like if it's on a CV, like, like Kirsty kind of said, sometimes people just want to see it in the CV and go, oh, well, they've done this. I'll look at this one more than the one other one. So um, I always put my when I was when I used to write CVs before I started my own company. I used to put a lot of um, emphasis on the the, the honors project, the, the dissertation work, the practical work, because that's everybody. Well, how many ten thousand people do sports science? But how many of them do actually work with athletes in the lab for the amount of time that we did? And we did a lot of lab hours, and you just you get you know how to talk about it. And then once you can talk, once you get in the room with somebody who can talk about it, then you improve your employment chances. Good, great. That's really interesting, Paul, because I, I emphasise a lot about the importance of doing like, these internships and going in and working in an applied setting. But it's great to to hear that you've you've taken that those kind of skills and knowledge that you learn from lab experience, which a lot of our students will end up doing. They will do a laboratory based project, um, and and taking those skills forward. Um, it's the same so yeah, as, just, sorry, the same as Fiona's mentioned about the I mentioned about the pub. It's the skills of having an absolutely bursted athlete in front of you who's about to pass out. Like, how do you how do you get that person safely out of the room? How do you like? There's so many risk analysis. There's so many things that you can get from internships and, and all that. But it, it starts like I never did any internships. I never got any further than that. Uh, most of that just comes from from in the lab um, and the the safety guys and the the techs and and the, the lectures. Yeah. Okay, good. Great to hear. Um, okay, uh, next question is, so uh, we, a lot of students on the call here who are either currently doing uh, an internship project for their final year, um, honours year project, or will be thinking about doing one um, within the next year or next couple of years. Uh, so what would what advice would you give to, to a student who's about to undertake an internship placement or is currently on a, an internship placement? What, what advice would you give them to make the most out of that? that placement in an applied setting. Uh, we'll go to you first again, Lewis. I um, don't want to give too many platitudes, but um, I think the best one that I can say is be curious when you're, when you're there. There's, it's not enough anymore or ever to just uh, do the internship because every year, for example, we have eight interns involved. So two with the first team and six with the academy. 
it's not enough to do the role to 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 really help yourself explore and get the kind of um the contacts after which you know so if i've had two interns so far that come back to me and constantly ask me questions and they're now still at university and they ask me different things and relevant questions and that connection i still have means that now i'm on their cvs to help them with their next opportunity if, as a reference you know because i know when they were here they worked really hard they explored different areas they weren't just satisfied with giving um, this is why we do this. They were going or asking me questions like, have you ever thought about doing it this way? Or can you tell me a little bit more about sleep? Can you tell me a bit more about why we do speed um, or testing 40 yards rather than 30 meters or 50 meters? It's these relevant questions that then help you have that contact with the sports science department, the physio, whomever you speak to, to then go, actually, that person's wanting to be here, wants to succeed, and I want to help them on that journey. Um, so on my internship, I found an area that no one else wanted to do, which was data. Um, and I found an area on top of that that we weren't doing, which was a type of load monitoring. So I went and researched that really heavily, looked at some of the research, presented something that I found and said, look, this is what I found. Uh, is it of interest? And then that sparked a conversation that, because I was working at the academy at the time, sparked a conversation with the academy, who then I had to present to the first team and the academy at that point, which then helped me with uh, the kind of... Uh, the job that I got whilst I was finishing my degree. So yeah, going above and beyond in certain areas, I think it's really important. Asking relevant questions or any questions. There aren't any stupid ones because we know you're a student and you're trying to be trying to be trying to learn whilst you're there. So yeah, that's my advice. Good, great final sound bite there, Lewis. Thanks, <laughs> uh, Kirsty. What from you, the experience you had on your internship? What's what would you pass on to to the current students? Um, I still don't feel like necessarily covered quite. <laughs> I would say yeah, be prepared. Don't be. I would say one good one that would be have a stable warm up routine. They like. I feel like when you go in the first bit of responsibility, you warm up. So having that, just it sounds it sounds quite stupid. Um, but having that, cause I ended up like um the head of sports science at Hibs had to nip away and he came back and I was already finished the warm up. He was like, oh my gosh, you did. It's fine. Um, but just doing little things like that, that they'll notice and taking a, taking account of what they actually do and having a little research around that. I remember, so obviously I started with them just after starting the third year. So I didn't really have much sports science knowledge yet and I didn't know what like a acute chronic workload ratio things like that so just doing a bit of research and then i'd go in and just pester them with questions um because I, I didn't really understand it but i would say definitely try and relate what you're doing at uni in what you're doing in the classroom to what you're doing practically because it just helps the understanding and puts together a bit easier excellent Brilliant. Thank you very much, Kirsty. I'm going to hand you back to Fiona, who will take us through some of the questions. There's been a few questions coming through, so I'll hand back to Fiona, who will take us through those. Yes, thanks, Nan. We've got minutes left of the panel, so I thought I'd look to the questions. Um, we've got one here at the top, which has got lots of votes, but I feel that we've answered it, which was what were the routes that took you into your roles? So I think a variety of anecdotes and stories, we've covered that. Um, then we've got what qualifications do elite sport employers look for example level two gym instructor level three personal trainer british weightlifting certificates do you take these into account so um i'm going to go to yourself lewis um for that question um yeah we do take these things into consideration if you're looking at job wise or for um internship roles um what we're looking for in terms of elite sports science is things like basis accreditation um i think uk sea is is great and there's other things like your your the pts but we're looking for basis accreditation and, and these kind of sports science related ones um specifically um the main things we're looking at because these aren't essential is actually your experiences now if you're looking at something like football for instance and um, why I think internships is really important. I think it's good to have internships in football, but having a varied 
internship background as well is really important. So understand how hockey and the different aspects of hockey and how that could relate into football and why don't we try something different in there, how ballet could help with goalkeepers, etc. These kind of varied internships or experiences are, is actually vital because that makes you stand out because a lot of people have these similar qualifications, but having that experience is essential. Um, but yeah, if I was to give you some qualifications, and Isaac is really good. Uh, like I say, bases accreditation for sports science, um, something like the Australian S uh, S &C or the NCSC, um, I think is better than the UKSC because um, they're more global. Um, and there's a few others that you can maybe get, like, uh, I don't know, some sort of data analytics qualification as well. Thank you, Lewis. No I'm going to move on to another question. Um, Katie um, has asked, a couple of you mentioned the emotional side of your roles. Um, how does this impact on your job and how do you deal with it? So quite a different tact of question. Uh, Kirsty, could I, I start with yourself? Definitely. Um, I suppose with that, I suppose if you're doing long hours and things, you can get uh, your professional and personal life kind of merged together at, at times. But um, I'd say having, how do you deal with it is more like you kind of have to, for example, with work, I use my personal phone. So I'll have people call me 10 at night. I have messages working with investment bankers. My phone goes off at 2, 3, 4 in the morning because they're still working. Um, so you have to just have complete, there, ha there are times you have to have complete separation because of way to, to be productive in your job. Um, if you did it non-stop, then I'd say your productivity and sort of outfits go down because that's my, um, my job's very KPI based. Uh, so key performance indicators. So if you're not hitting them, then it flags up. So um, I'd say having separation between the two and not taking too much to heart if, if, it, if it, you're going through a tough batch at the time. Um, but that's definitely something I've improved over the, over the last couple of years um, rather than getting too sucked in. But not sure if that really answers that too yeah, well. I think, I, think, I think this is something to be aware of and something that you learn. It's not something that necessarily comes naturally. And sometimes that learning's born out of need. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. Paul, have you got any uh, thoughts on that question about in the emotional side of your job and how you might deal with it? Yeah, I mean, it, it's not easy. Um, like I say, you are dealing dealing with people who are in pain or vulnerable, and it can be very difficult. And the best physiotherapists are generally people who are the most empathetic, who help you through that process but it is invariably very difficult not to sometimes take that home with you and um, mm -hmm. i'd recommend having two small children because then you can't think about anything else when you come home but even with that i mean like i i, I think I'm, I'm good at what i do because i am so personal and, and i do kind of buy in with all my patients um it's it's not easy but it's simple little things like um like your own personal um sleep hygiene, your your own personal mental health. The, the old saying goes that when they're on an airplane, put on your own oxygen mask first before you try and help anybody else. Um, you give so much of yourself away in, in, in some of these roles that um, like looking after yourself with regular exercise. I know when I'm regularly exercising and I'm eating well and things like meditation, but just, just getting off my phone, getting off social media, all the usual stuff that you tell people to reduce anxiety and reduce general kind of well, improve wellness is, is vitally important because you, you do have to begin to compartmentalize the, the emotional side of it. Um, because there's a, there's a high churn rate and there's a lot of people drop out from the profession, not just from when they're actually studying it, but actually when you get to a burnout point that, um, there is a, there's a lot of frustration as to why people don't get better. There's a, like, you can sometimes put a lot of pressure on yourself. So, um, emotionally, if you're not able to cope with that, um, it can be a very challenging job to have to go back in the next day. So 100%, your own, how you deal with your own emotions, uh, your own mental health um, is, is, is what you can control. And it's just the very basic stuff of, like I say, look after yourself, diet, exercise, and just um, try not to, to, to take on too much from it. Thank you. Thank you. Lewis, any any tips on how you deal with your job? I think, uh, sorry, Paul said it really well there. Um, 
and and Kirsty said another thing that I think is really important about that separation. Um, for me, I think that separation is the most important. But one thing on top of the guys saying there is uh, a support network. I think is probably the most vital thing for me. Um, is having people around me that I can then go and lean on because when you work however many days in a row and your team's not performing very well and you feel like you're under the cosh or uh, a new manager's just come in, the amount of work that you have to do at that point is staggering and you do burn out incredibly quickly. So having a support network that you can then go to deal with it in that kind of regards is very, very crucial in my opinion because like Paul said, the turnout, turnover rate in football is massive. We have 18 months, I think, you have a new manager and the average sports scientist will be in the role for about two to three years before moving on to another club in the English Premier League. Um, so, yeah, burnout's, burnout's very, very something that happens a lot here. So having that support yeah. work network is important. So the last question for me, and if you could make it to as uh, succinct as possible, that would be helpful. How desirable are post-grad qualifications to, I'm going to say to elite sport employers, but to, 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 your, to your roles in general? Uh, so start with Kirsty. Yeah, so um, I say having a master's or postgraduate qualifications definitely gives you that sort of standout element. I know just from I essentially recruit for other companies at the moment and yeah if someone's got a master's there someone with an undergrad's there you you put them slightly further up but of course it depends on the person as well but I say it does give you a little bit of a step up so. yeah and and Paul I'm presuming you needed can you <laughs> yeah um very much so um a little bit like what Kirsty says is that there's a box of CVs here and you first screen of them is where's your what's your education level and um, there's more and more people coming out every year with undergraduate degrees and master's degrees and even PhDs now and kind of master's degree is getting a little bit like the the, the, the new undergraduate degree so um it, it's you, like I say, you need to get it once you can get in the room with somebody you can convince and convince and then sell yourself for any kind of a job but these qualifications are often needed now to actually just physically get in the door and yeah. everybody's doing them and um, that's the tough thing um there's there's not many uh i know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody these days uh, that's kind of that's gone by by now so it's yeah. uh, it will get into it thank you and lewis yourself last last answer yeah i think uh there was a recent survey done and 58 percent of people in rugby league sports science had a postgraduate degree so I think that alone shows you that how important it is to get kind of up to that level um, to get into elite sport. Cool well thank you very much all of you today um, Nen and I are very grateful um, it's been a really interesting panel uh, so I think we're just time's running out we've got one minute left on the panel so once again thank you for sharing your time particularly on busy days as we has been indicated uh, and your expertise and experience. Uh, I'm sure the audience have got lots from it. Thank you. Thank you very much.